Good afternoon. My name is Muzna Hassan. I'm an Egyptian feminist and I'm a founder of Nazra for Feminist Studies. Nazra is a group that has been functioning in Egypt for years, uh, from 2005 as a group, then as a registered organization uh, aims to serving to continue the feminist movements in Egypt and in the MENA region. I'm also a founder of uh, a women in politics uh, uh, caucus in the MENA region, focus on uh, uh, track to and peace processes uh, by women in politics using feminist approaches uh, in the region. I'm also a founder of uh, the first feminist fund in the region called Durea Feminist Fund, and the fund mainly focusing and trying to grant young groups uh, and fresh ones uh, to uh, continue uh, their struggle for the feminist movements and negotiating the resources for the feminist movements locally, regionally, and internationally. First of all, I'm so happy and proud to be uh, in this workshop with you, and I'm really, really sorry not to be present physically or being interactively alive with you. It's really something out of my hand, but it's never too late. Uh, we can, after you listen to uh, the presentation I will give, I'm available all the time for discussion. And also if you want to organize uh, a live uh, discussion with me, I'm available. Uh, anytime uh, next week. You can also contact me uh, on my email, mozn, M -O -Z -M, at nazra, N -A -Z -R -A .org, uh, for any uh, inquiries or questions or anything. Uh, today, uh, I will share with you a, a short presentation about uh, uh, the title of this uh, workshop when I was in, happily invited by Right Livelihood uh, uh, Group to have this workshop uh, with you. I was thinking about what is about, what can I present to you? What can you gain from someone who's so local <laughs> uh, and from this hard uh, region, which is the MENA region? Um, I was thinking mainly, and you can see in my presentation, I will try to unpack many of the concepts and understanding for many people uh, about the feminist movements in our region, and trying to present an approach and a narrative of many of the people inside the feminist movements in our region. Uh, and how they use different concepts and uh, theories to implement their work and to analyze their tactics, in addition to give some glimpses and uh, uh, information about the struggles of uh, the feminist movements in our region. So if we can begin my presentation is about gender feminism and empowerment from the eyes of Mina Feminist perspective. Uh, we can uh, begin by uh, having the theoretical framework. Uh, if we can define gender as the WHO defines it, that gender refers to the characteristics of women, men, girls, and boys that are socially constructed. This includes norms, behaviors, and rules associated with being a woman, man, girl, or boy, as well as relationships with others. As a social construct, gender varies from society to society and can change over time. Uh, I know I'm not with you, but if you can have a pen and a pencil, if you are writing and you are so young and writing on your notebook or uh, uh, iPad or on mobile, I think we can have some of the the concepts and the, some of the the words with us within this time to build on it maybe we can focus on social construct gender as a social construct then 
if we can define feminism as an interdisciplinary approach to issues of equality and equity based on gender, gender expression, gender identity, sex, and sexuality, as understood through social theories and political activism. And if you want to write with me, you can write social theories and political activism. If we can define empowerment as a concept, it, uh, it has been used to highlight positivity, implement wellness, and enhance a healthy environment rather than blaming the victims. This approach includes a multi-level contextual analysis of an environment to understand how it could be benefic beneficial through empowerment outcomes. If we can add in our paper or writing, just add with me this uh, uh, multi-level contextual analysis. What specifically women empowerment, it's a concept of a multi-layer of analysis has unique tools within empowerment theory. Women's empowerment is viewed as a, a strategic life choice containing resources, agency, and achievement. Autonomy is a step ahead which leads to empowerment, placing violence and continuous culture values of inequality or justification of violence is not building women's empowerment. And to add the concept of multi-layers of analysis. And if we can, before going to the second framework, uh, if we can see what is linked between gender feminism uh, and uh, empowerment generally, and specifically women's empowerment, we can see how all these def definitions contain something constructively, constructively about the social construction. It's mainly about understanding the ecosystem and the multi-layers of these issues inside a society. And society could be a country, it could be a small community, and could be a region. And it is mainly about how we can see these things or changing uh, in definition and in implementation, and also how the feminist movements and women movements and different social movements have been using them in different uh, and have been using these frameworks in different tactics which are changing in time and space. So the main thing about understanding what's happening in our region from my perspective and my positionality to understand that there is no different one definition for gender. There is no one implementation for women's empowerment. It's there is no one wave and one school for feminism as a theory or as a practice. One of the other theories or frameworks many feminists internationally and also in the South have been using for years and has been inherited more in our region in the last decade is what we call personalist political or private is a political slogan. <clears throat> it is a slogan expressing a common belief among feminists that the personal experience of women are rooted in their political situation and gender inequality. It became fa famous following 1970 when Carol Hans, one of the uh, American uh, feminists, wrote an essay argued that many personal experiences, especially for women, could be traced to one's location within a system of power relationships. And being back to the theories, we have been defining in a way and writing together this multi-layers, the, the concept of intersectionality, the concept of contextualization. It's also here continuing this logic of thinking of understanding the different powers and different power relationships through personal women's experiences and how to build it to into the public sphere. This concept also could be misused that we are 
as women or feminists are so emotional and we are so into ourselves and into our personal experiences, so we want to implement it on the public. Honestly, this concept is more rooted than this. It is not about one only personal experience. It's about how to understand the personal experiences and the private life of women, which we can be sharing many of these uh, experiences and have the, this, what we will speak about after that, our women or feminist solidarity and our constructive solidarity after that. So it's not about individualistic personal experience, it's about how the personal experiences and differences of it have something shared in the values in understanding analysis and acting to, to see and to try to balance the power dynamic and power relationships in different societies. Uh, if we try to implement some of these concepts uh, in the Egyptian feminist movements, historically, these principles uh, addressed the importance of empowerment through communities uh, and to understand this knowledge of inside the, uh, the communities of oppression, alongside community theories to help people in changing their situation. It is about this choice of the people to change and to act against these power relationships. Uh, one of uh, the uh, professors uh, in psychology, Henny Henry, argued that the empowerment theory through women fighting sexism in Egypt, especially on in the field of uh, domestic violence, has an element by understanding these concepts and especially the empowerment on women empowerment concepts and implemented in different legal and social uh, uh, changes and use this social legitimacy and some of the spaces to amend laws and have legal reform in order to, uh, to gain more rights. Uh, he also argued that the fights uh, of uh, the feminist movements uh, uh, by Analyze, uh, analyzing the power dynamics they seek men support sometimes and also they used educational and professional tools and it led to different successes. These elements also can be understood as a tool for resilience against the patriarchal dominated approaches. The feminist movements have been using uh, these elements to challenge these patriarchal approaches. Using empowerment theory in analyzing data provide insights regarding understanding oppression and how to counter it. These approaches can help in both analysis analyzing what's happening in the communities and the society and also how to go through some tactics and innovative uh, tools of changes in order to uh, to fight some of the inequalities and also try to balance the society to have more empowerment and more rights for for many others while we are again be back towards gender that it's not only about one woman, it's not only about one man, it is this combination within uh, different societies and uh, and communities. Many of uh, the, these approaches could be analyzed from this ecological theory, which has this multi-layers of understanding what is beyond every action from the individual to the micro and reaching the macro level within different communities and societies, and also to understand the approaches of resilience, uh, different social movements, especially the feminist movement have been using in different places. Uh, 
one the main example I want to share with you today is uh, how the Egyptian feminist movements have been uh, fighting sexual violence, especially in the public sphere. As someone who's always saying that I'm so proud and always proud to be an Egyptian feminist. I know that I'm coming from this society and we all come from this society which women have been struggling to gain their rights and fighting inequality from 1919, so more than 100 years. Women have been struggling this by existing in the public sphere in different revolutions or struggles against occupation or trying to engage within public sphere and also changing women's situation in the private sphere. Egypt wrote its first constitution in 1923. And from this time, women have been asking about their rights to be included inside the, the constitution and the legal system, especially focusing on the uh, right of uh, the rights in the private sphere or the personal status law as it was it is named in uh, uh, in Egypt after 1952 for the first time Egypt has been running by a president by a system or a regime who are originally Egyptians but at the same time, it has this military approaches and it has its consequences on the different social movements. So it co-opted the question of the social movements and the feminist question and the women's question in different ways from this time. Before, before 1952 and in the first two years when the military regime uh, uh, ruled uh, Egypt, uh, there were many feminist move, uh, groups and many feminists have been calling for the rights for women in the constitution and how to continue this narrative from 1923. Uh, the main piece was Doria Shafiq, who did many struggles until she has been arrested and then kept uh, in house arrest. Uh, at this time, they banned her, uh, the organization she was uh, leading, and then the military regime co-opted this question by uh, passing an article in the first Egyptian constitution after 1923, which was 1956. Uh, adding the right of women to participate in the political uh, processes and co-opted that they did this for the Egyptian women. This system continued until the 1970s and from the 80s, the, this was a beginning of constructive organizations and uh, non-governmental organizations have been established in Egypt and had this connection with different state figures like the first lady at this time trying to ask questions and trying to do legal changes in the personal status laws and others. This wave of non-governmental organizations or groups structured by women's rights and more feminist approaches have been increased in the 2000s and different wave began to exist about co re-co-opting and regaining our question and our struggle as a local movement for years. Uh, the Arab Spring or the Egyptian Revolution happened in 2011 and it was a shift uh, in Egypt at this time that new generation, younger people, fresh people have been engaging in the public sphere, a different public sphere have been constructed at this time and also new actors and new discourses have been existing at this time. But while this is happening, if we can see the narrative of and different incidents talking about sexual violence in uh, uh, in the public sphere in Egypt, we couldn't talk about what has been happening after 2011 without mentioning that in 2005, 
some women and men have been protesting against the previous uh, president in Egypt, Hosni Mubarak, who tried at this time and succeeded at this time to amend the constitution and extended his presence, uh, presidency. Some non-state thugs, in a way, attacked this protest and sexually assaulted women who were protesters. And for the first time for years, the issue of sexual violence in the public sphere have been opened and has this political layer. In 2007, reports for uh, independent media and the beginning of the question of social media and Facebook at this time and different uh, blogs have been receiving reports and uh, on mob sexual assaults in one of uh, the Eid or the Islamic festivals uh, uh, in downtown in 2008 when Egypt won the African Cup also different organizations and uh, civic and uh, independent uh, bloggers received uh, uh, reports on uh, uh, occurring of mob sexual assaults. Then in 2011, when the revolution happened and the first wave of the revolution in the 18 days of chanting against Mubarak, uh, Many reports came about how it is the utopia that nothing is happening. It's about all women and men existing together from different backgrounds, from different social uh, status and other uh, things. But on the day of uh, Mubarak stepping down, which was February 11, 2011, uh, an American uh, reporter called uh, Laura Logan reported mob sexual assaults against her at this day inside Tahrir Square, which was the place of the revolution or chanting or sit-ins against uh, Mubarak, and it continued to be the place of revolution or changing after that. At this time, many groups and the feminist groups at this time and the new generation have been in existing in the public sphere have been entering this discussion and about that, is it a one case thing? Is it about xenophobia or it is something reopen the question about the existence of women in the public sphere. And some of us have been remembering what happened in 2005, 2007, 2008. At the same time, the many sit-ins and protests continued, and in, uh, on 8th of March, the first International Women's Day after the revolution, many women and men decided to have a march uh, for uh, the International Women's Day, and this march has been attacked by non-state actors and civic people, not people coming from any uh, political or any uh, security background. Also, it was about that. Is it about this uh, existence of the International Women's Day? And we, we received at this time many of the arguments from political activists that maybe it's not the priority, maybe you outrages uh, those who uh, protested outrages, uh, ordinary people, maybe it is not sensitive enough, something like this. And on the second day, on 9th of March, 2011, when the military raided one of the sit-ins, some of women and men have been uh, arrested, and some of those women uh, uh, had virginity tests for them. This also opened the question about the women's bodies by inside this time of a revolution that how people who are ruling this country, who mainly men in power, militant, and accepting violence and increasing violence structurally, are seeing women who are protesting if they are virgin or not. And virginity is too complex in the Egyptian context that it means like virgin women are good women and non-virgin women are bad women. And one of the generals at this time, uh, 
who became to be our president, uh, uh, said that we did this for those women to know if they are good women or not. So this increased this question about how people generally who are ruling or have certain power dealing with those women. In uh, December 2011, also the military raided one of the sit-ins and uh, they dragged many women and men in the streets. One of those women, when they dragged her, they unwarded her and they found that she was wearing a blue bra. And this photo has been everywhere and it was so outrageous. And at the same time, it, op it has this backlash from through the regime at this time, or what we call them at this time, pro stability, and again, these protests that why a woman protester was wearing abaya. Abaya is this uh, long uh, uh, wear women wear in, in Egypt to protect them, or in different countries in the Middle East, and why she was wearing uh, abaya and she just a blue bra. Uh, but this incident also was outrageous to many people that no, there is something wrong happening to women's bodies in the public sphere. And after that, many young groups and young political groups uh, organized a protest, uh, uh, refusing what was happening. And the slogan at this time was say was saying that women's, Egyptian women's bodies are red lines. And I think it is one of the beginning of understanding and creating this local on the ground movements to combat sexual violence in the public sphere. After that, the Muslim Brotherhood, who are the main Islamic political group uh, ruled Egypt, uh, uh, in 2012, and different protests and sit-ins began to be against uh, their type of ruling, and many struggles happened against them. At this time, and from June 2012, many reports, many organizations, such as Nazra, as example, received reports and documented cases of structural mob sexual assaults and gang rape happened in the Tahrir Square. Uh, this happened in June 2012. In November 2012, then the outrages and the harshest attacks happened in January 2013. And at this time, the groups understood that there is something structure happening. It's happening by non-state actors, but at the same time, it's not one case. So focusing about what happened to Lara Logan, so it wasn't something happening for the first time. These incidents continued until the day of the inauguration of the current president, Abu Fattah sisi when some women have been sex mob sexually assaulted and gang raped in Tahrir Square. Uh, being back to the concepts we, we spoke about, I do say, I argue, and we do argue that the, the younger and fresh feminist groups have been using all these concepts to organize themselves with different innovative and collective work to combat violence against women, especially sexual violence in the public sphere. Many young uh, groups have been organizing themselves to try to protect women and drag them and support them to be out of what we called at this time the circle of hell, which women were facing this mob sexual assaults and some kinds of, of torture like beating or other uh, harsh uh, things. Others have been working on providing collective services Legal at this time wasn't a big thing, but having this medical, psychological, and accompanying those women through their processes. Others were doing this advocacy that, and I will know that this thing is happening, and at the same time, 
we should be aware that it's not the sea to be and this place is not utopia by any way. Uh, other structure groups have been working in this awareness within the political groups, people who are ruling at this time, the security forces and other things, which some of the successes happened after that, that we gained the first national strategy to combat violence against women in 2014. The, ver the first committee combating violence against women have been organized and opened inside the Ministry of Interior in 2013. The first specialized committee of female for uh, forensics uh, also opened in 2015. A changing in one of the articles by the first time defining the sexual harassment, not the sexual assaults, or redefining or revisiting the rape uh, articles was happening also in 2013. This collective work and this intersectional uh, by understanding the different communities and not and talking about this issue which is happening in Tahrir Square to opening the discussions about the private sphere and be back to the concept of personal is political, made us understand why this is happening in different ways. Because if you are in a country by the latest uh, Egyptian demographic uh, uh, survey said that most uh, more than 58% of the Egyptian women are facing one type of violence against them in the private sphere. So it's automatically what's happening in the public sphere is understood. If different surveys came and said that the, the percentage of sexual harassment that at least more than 90% of Egyptian women at least faced once sexual harassment, so having a systematic sexual violence or gang rape in a place which was so political and have lots of people anyway, and with this argument that it is a utopia and other things, so it makes this immunity happening, so it will increase by any way. So within what was happening, and it continued this sparks of continues to fight violence against women in 2018, Egypt had its type and its formation of me too. So many survivors came out by their names or anonymous, accusing many well-known people, artists, journalists, political uh, uh, activists and political leaders uh, uh, through the state and from so-called uh, leftist groups or uh, civic groups. And, and this, this was another wave of localizing not only Me Too, but the struggle against sexual violence in Egypt. In 2020, when everyone in the world and Egypt was asking about the epidemic and the coronavirus, Egyptian women, especially the younger generation, were trying to work on their uh, on their uh, pandemic. Uh, when we were fighting the pandemic, we were dealing with our epidemic, which is sexual violence. So many young groups use the social media, especially Instagram, to advocate against uh, big cases have been happening in one of the Egyptian American universities. Uh, the other uh, uh, systematic uh, uh, gang rape happened to one of the, or many of the women inside one of the well-known uh, hotels and other things. All this struggle brought many successes, but it had lots of victims who they tried and others they tried with them to go through the survival uh, processes, but also had its backlash. Many of those women who have been so active or faces to speak against what was happening and the systematic sexual violence against Egyptian women have been targeted by state and non-state actors. So they have been accused of 
uh, defaming uh, Egypt reputation, uh, have uh, relationship with international forces uh, to destroy Egypt, uh, supporting women to have a responsible liberty, and sometimes that they are the uh, different smear campaigns against them that they are uh, killing the revolution, they are making women afraid of existing in the public sphere, they are trying to co-opt the revolution question, or they are lawyers that it's, it's not happening and they fake these things. Uh, and it, this continuous of these uh, struggles, I I also argue that one of the most important of the continuous of the narratives and these discourses it is what we call the constructive solidarity. For example, uh, many of those women gained constructive solidarity by being with them in this process as, from, from being victims to survivors accompanying them and even with organizations which have been attacked at this time or the images of those women who have been destroyed and this character assassination have been happening to those women for years. This constructive solidarity also by understanding that the feminist movement is an international one, has different implications in different societies, gained many regional and international uh, support by talking and republishing what's happening in uh, in Egypt uh, for women, supporting women who have been facing this judicial harassment or uh, public uh, smear campaigns or even attacks from other political groups who are supposedly the opposition of uh, the state or, or the regime. All of these tools and inspiration in constructive solidarity honestly helped in continue the discussion opened on different generations to continue doing their work and creating their innovative uh, tools uh, to fight. I think I spoke too much and uh, finally Personally, I want to thank uh, the Right Livelihood uh, Award and all the team of keeping their constructive solidarity with me personally and with Nazra for Family Studies for years and continue this support by giving the space and uh, supporting us in this constructive solidarity in multi layers of. Uh, the international uh, arenas and also connecting uh, people like us together to have these uh, discussions. Uh, and while we are talking about constructive solidarity, I call all of you to uh, raise your voices and support the Tunisian feminists now who are facing this constructive uh, attacks uh, by the president and many of the voices uh, against them inside Tunisia. We opened uh, an open pool in Nazra to have this solidarity with those feminists also think and have the sharing experiences and listen to Yemeni women, Libyan women, uh, Tunisian, uh, Sudanese women, women living uh, in Lebanon or Syrian women and Turkish women who have been facing uh, the earthquake and other and see the work for those women who have been struggling too, 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 too much to have their processes and for this constructive solidarity, having this connection between feminists in this region for years helped all of us we gained from the Tunisian feminists when they were writing uh, their constitution and it helped us. We have been in connection with uh, Sudanese women when this reopening of systematic rape have been happening in the protests and uh, we share these experiences. We all learn from the Yemeni women who have been constructively working on the ground to have the peace processes and have their spaces in the table. Uh, 
locally and using different tools. The support and solidarity for all those women, I do think that this is the only way for these movements to continue. And uh, again, thank you so much for having this time to listen to me. Also, um, as I said in the beginning, I'm available uh, to organize a live discussion uh, uh, together. And finally, if you felt anything from this discussion, I uh, encourage you to write one of the your experiences using these frameworks and see uh, an example of constructive solidarity and share it with all the participants and others who have who are uh, joining these series of workshops thank you